maybe some of you might be a little curious about where we're going to church now. <clears throat> so I thought I'd give you a few facts and maybe Mark can chirp in a bit here if I miss some stuff. Just to kind of bring you up to speed about what we're doing. Actually, we're members of the Farmingdale Church, but we don't go to church there. The Farmingdale Church is the sponsoring church for the Lewiston Church Plant, and that's where we're going to church. So I'm going to give you a little few facts on that church. Um, we meet for Sabbath school and church in the Lewiston Armory. I don't know if any of you have seen that building, but it's like built in 1920. It's huge. It is mostly gymnasium, and it's surrounded by two floors of rooms with balconies all the way around. It is this massive building, and we meet in um, two, well, one big room for that's designated for senior citizens during the week, and on the weekend, on Sabbath morning, we have it for four hours, something like that. And then we also have a Sabbath school room, which is upstairs on the other side, which makes for interesting getting back and forth because we have to traipse through all of the onlookers for basketball, volleyball, pickleball, you name it. We have to walk through that with our Bibles and all of our Sabbath school stuff. So it's kind of interesting. Um, Should you decide to visit us, if you're facing the armory, you go in the right side doors and we're just right there. And I, I encourage you to come and visit and see what's going on there. Talk about displacement. We have got a group meeting there that are totally, well, close to totally displaced and are finding a new home. Um, You can imagine, because of the gymnasium, the incredible amount of noise that's going on. So if you imagine a sermon happening and whistles and referees yelling and parents cheering and whatever else is going on, balls bouncing, you got it. That's what we do. (laughs) But you know what? I don't even pay any attention to that anymore. I don't even really pay much attention to to it at all, even even during potluck. But anyway, <clears throat> it's just something. The first Sabbath I noted, and after that I didn't hear it anymore. Um, the, we have an average attendance of around 30 to 50 people. And we started, De- what, December 3rd? Somewhere. Not that long ago, and we got close to that. And these are not Adventists from around local churches. These are people from Lewiston. Um, yeah. Um, no, not originally, but they live in Lewiston now. Yeah. A good portion are not Adventists who are coming. Some of them are. Some of them, we have somebody trying to move their membership from out from Angola. So... There's a challenge. We probably won't get their membership for a year or more. <laughs> Who knows how that works? And like just this week, nine more flew in and are joining and coming to church today. And they are scrambling, trying to find rides for them because most of the people have no rides. So we are now considering the possibility of but a van, but I'm not sure a van's going to be enough. So pray for that for us. If you want to pray for something specific is transportation. Mark goes around and picks up a van full of people twice every Sabbath morning and brings them into church. Sometimes he's full, sometimes he's not. Sometimes he's over full, and they don't speak English, a lot of them. So him telling you to get out, I have too many, doesn't work. So he just hopes nobody sees him driving with more people than the van holds. Right, Bruce? (laughs) Oh, they don't care. Um, most of them are immigrants from Africa, Angola, Burundi, um, Rwanda. Amazing. We don't have any Somalians, but Somalians are primarily Muslim and they are very staunch in their religious beliefs. So wouldn't be wonderful if we get a Somali to join, but that means that there are multiple, um, languages going on in our church. Um, (laughs) The pastor, who is the pastor of the Farmingdale Church, is our pastor, and he's now split between the two groups. He speak, He's from Burundi, and he speaks their language. And I don't know how well they all understand, but they all communicate pretty well. I don't have a clue. I don't even know how they say the word no. You know, in Spanish, no is no, right? You kind of understand, but 
nothing. I, some of them speak partial English, so they, you get this jumbled, oh, yeah, yo, wait, I'm following you now, and then it's mixed up again. And then some of them speak very good English. One of them, he's been here about four years. You would never know he's not from Miami or, you know, somewhere. So it makes for a challenge. We have to get translation sometimes. We've had translation during the church service. And they're working on getting those little things you put in your ear so that you can hear the sermon in your language. But then we have to have somebody there who will do the talking to translate it. So it's a bit of a challenge and rather expensive. So that's what they're working on right now. <clears throat> Sabbath school has about 10 kids in it currently. Nine more like I just, no, seven more like I just said arrived this week. So that's even a challenge because those kids, a lot of them, don't speak English. And to even pretend to keep them occupied and involved and focused, uh, I don't even know how I'm going to do that. Because up until now, I've had most of them can understand a little bit of English. So pray for me. <laughs> oh. Yes, my job is to teach the primary and, and um, junior classes. Um, when we went, we said, we'll do whatever you need to be done, and that's it. Um, I play the piano, but we're, we're um, splitting that up now. Some of the Africans can play the piano, and they play by ear. So if they know what the songs are ahead of time, they're willing to. So we're going to kind of, I'm going to kind of back off and let them be involved because the biggest part of becoming a church is being involved. And so we're going to kind of do that and see how that goes. <clears throat> um. For the church service, we sit in at tables, little square tables that seat about four. But if you pull chairs around, ten can sit around them. <laughs> and that's what the kids do. Their table's right up front, and all the kids all gather to the front and sit around all one table. And we've been having a little bit of a challenge keeping them interested because there's they don't have anything. They don't bring anything to do. So um, we've started passing out the guides now and doing things and like Bible study pamphlets and things. So they'll sit there and they'll work on those now. Before it was tic-tac-toe and Jenga and a bunch of games, and they would just kind of chatter along. But so things are improving there too. God is so good. We run into a snafu and he fixes it. And then we run into another snafu. So this whole van thing or whatever, we're, we're waiting for, for more information from him about that because... I don't know. I was on the board here when we were trying to decide whether we needed to get a truck or something. I forgot what it was, but a vehicle. And all the things that go into getting a vehicle are still issues if we get something, insurance, drivers, you know, all of that. But they don't seem near as important anymore. It's interesting. But the most interesting thing I think about the logistics is that Church is in a room, maybe a little bit shorter than this, not so wide maybe, but right behind the, the talk speaker is the kitchenette and potluck and all the food going on and people coming in, putting their food in the oven, taking it out. Oh no, and you're sitting there watching, don't take my food out, it's not hot, but what can you say? You're in the middle of a sermon. So they'll take your food out, turn it up to 500 and put their pizza in. And I swear, I have smelled burning food <laughs> several times, but it hasn't burnt. So thank the Lord, it was my COVID nose that, that I misread. But, you know, even all of this, best of all, is that you can feel the Holy Spirit there. They are so warm and so loving and so eager to talk and to interact with you, to pray. It's amazing. They want to pray about everything. I'm thinking, wow. If, if you want to pray about anything, shouldn't I be taking that seriously? So just their, their, um, their sweetness, all of that is just very warming when you're there. Yeah, I got the best hug from one of them I ran into at the hospital. And she gave me the biggest hug, both arms, and just like really squeezed me. And I was like, wow, that's a hug, you know. So And she gives me one every Sabbath. But the Holy Spirit is there. He, you can feel his presence. You can feel 
the camaraderie among the people. And even if they don't understand, they're still paying attention. And hopefully we can get the translation thing fixed sooner than later. So now with all these changes in our lives this year, I've been having to learn about making decisions. But the harder part, even now more, is the waiting part of decision making. Decisions are made of different parts up, right? You get an option, you weed through them, you pick one, and then you wait. And that's what my sermon is about today. Seems like a lot of my sermons have to do with what I'm going through right this moment. And this one is a toughie. So that's what you're going to listen (laughs) to. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for an opportunity for your spirit to speak to our heart, to show us ways that each one of us can respond to you in this difficult thing that you ask us to do. And that's the waiting on you. So I ask that your spirit fill each one of us this morning as we listen. In your precious name, Jesus, I ask these things. Amen. So I'm still in process on this waiting thing. This sermon is like really far from being done. So it might be a cliffhanger or maybe not, but maybe you all have the same idea or you have more information you can give me about your experience with it. So I'll have to get back with you if there's any further developments. But here it is. If I want to give God the glory in waiting on him to lead in my decision-making process, and I do, that's what I want, then I'm going to need to learn the way he wants me to wait for him to make his move. I'm going to have to learn it. It sounds easy, right? Just came right out. I just spoke it. But I can tell you for the last several weeks, it's, it's not been that easy. (laughs) Um, open thine ears and you shall hear the word behind thee saying this is the way walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand when you turn to the left for this is God our God forever and ever he will be our guide unto death a man's heart devises his way but the Lord directeth his steps the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. And my favorite, and I will bring the blind by the way they knew not, and I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things I will do unto them and not forsake them. So the question is, can God give these promises to us and then nothing happen, nothing come of it, just nice words we claim for comfort to make ourselves feel better, but nothing really comes of those promises. Is that how we think? Is that how we act? So I ask any of you, do you have trouble waiting on God? Am I alone in this thing? Because I'll tell you what, if I am, I'm, <laughs> I'm in a sea Excuse me. Thank you. So you may be wondering even now what to do in a right situation, a tight situation, a tough situation. So example, where to go to college, Amber. You might be wondering about a new job, career change. You might wonder about buying a house, selling a house. How about change to a new school? Maybe even going back to school making a very large purchase, picking a spouse. All of these are intensive situations, and and I might add brutal, just something. (laughs) Unfortunately, I'm not a very patient person, and so this lesson has been very difficult for me to learn, and I'm not sure. I keep thinking, okay, Lord, I've learned it now. Let's go on. (laughs) No, apparently not. So when it comes to questions like these, I've had plenty of time to ponder and try to understand God's promises on waiting for his direction for myself. I encourage people all the time, pray about it. He'll give you an answer. But when you're in it and it's you, it's a different story. So I want to learn how it works now so I don't have to learn later when it's much worse, much harder, much more difficult, whatever that way might be. So some decisions 
and the wait for those decisions aren't very long and they're not really all that important. Do I want broccoli or do I want peas? Uh, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. All the way to high stakes decisions and the weight that happens with them. It can be a make or a break, a life or a death, and then that waiting can be brutal. They've even invented a popular game about making decisions. It's called Would You Rather. Have any of you heard that game? Probably the kids have, yeah. So it goes something like this, and never mind that these decisions are made with little thought about God. Just put that aside. So here's a sample of some of the questions you might get to choose from based on your human reasoning, your human wisdom, your prudence. They go something like this. For example, would you rather be in jail for five years or be in a coma for a decade? That's terrible. (laughs) Would you rather have universal respect or unlimited power? Would you rather spend a year entirely alone or a year without a home? Would you rather sleep without a pillow and blanket on a chilly night or eat sour milk on your breakfast cereal? So uh, my, co- <laughs> my co-workers play this game all the time, and it's just like, oh, don't do that. Of course, I have to sit and ponder. I can't just blow it off. What would I do? <laughs> so waiting on God is, a di- is to direct you is not a factor, though, for them. Most of the world doesn't include God in. I was talking to a patient this week. I forgot what it was that we were talked it in talked it about, but she said, oh, it was about a decision, and she said, I believe in fate. I said, fate? What do you mean by fate? Oh, you know, she couldn't even define it for me. She threw out a few words, spiritual, presence, being in the, you know, she threw the, I said, well, I don't really know what that means. I kind of look at it from a God point, a God thing. Yeah, she goes, yeah, it's not that I don't believe in God, but it's fate, you know. Good luck. And then she told me this, good luck, bad luck, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Have you heard that before? It's part of a religion. It might be Hinduism. Anyway, you can Google it. But that's how she deals with decisions and things that happen in life. And I thought, wow, can I put that in my sermon? So I just did. There you got it. Can add that to your thinking process. So, but we as Christians find ourselves in a bit different situation, right? And I'm talking about your heart belongs to God. I'm not talking about a name only. I'm talking about you are a Christian. We find ourselves in this different situation during our dilemmas. Big or small, we have a God involved who asks us to give our problems to him, and he will point the way. So unlike the world, When we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place, we cry out to God and we say, I need help. I can't make this decision. I don't know what to do. What do you want me to do, God? What will bring glory to you? I am praying and waiting for you, God, to move and direct. Chris's favorite word, crickets. Maybe not to the death. But sometimes I've been in these situations. You know, some people have to make decisions and it's life and death. And so I don't know that I've actually been at that point. But people will sometimes tell me in the decisions I make, we have a part to play, remember? I asked a pastor that one time, we have a part to play. I said, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, and then he gave me an answer. And I said, a part to play, but it doesn't say that. It says, what do you want me to do, God? I will direct your path. So, yes, we do have a part to play, and I understand that. But I don't think the part to play is the actual manipulation of events, the doing as much as coming to God with your request and keeping it before him. I don't know. Maybe you guys can th- tell me what you think after you've pondered this for a little while. Some people say we have a part to play. What would that part be? A half a part? One fourth part? Give God two options. You go, God. I've I've done that. Or wait on God and see what he directs us to do. These are questions I've been struggling with for a long time, and this year even more so. 
And surely I, I believe that God knows as we're growing, he, he, I don't know if he winks, but he has pity on us, mercy on us as we go through this decision waiting process. But what is the best way God wants to deal with the waiting part? So remember, I'm in the, ju- I'm in the process, so don't judge me too hard on this. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. I say, wait, wait. So most likely you and I have different ideas on this waiting thing, but we both are probably pretty bad at it. At least I would like to really meet somebody who's very good at it. And I, I'll I'll mention, oh no, I can tell you now. Pavel Goya has stories about waiting on the Lord. And I mean, literal waiting. And the events that come out of it is just amazing. So if you ever have a chance, listen to one of his talks. It just, it just validates everything I've been thinking about in this process. So our Bible story today starts in 1 Samuel 13. You don't necessarily have to read along in that because I'm not going to read it from there. I'm going to read it to you out of the desire of ages. And I was reading this one morning for worship and it's just like, oh, this is, this is me. Different situation, different time, different, you know, but. And I thought, okay, Lord, that's going to be a good sermon, but I got to develop that now. And and believe me, I shouldn't have asked for that because the developing has been happening. Mm. So the the chapter is chapter 60 in, it's called the presumption of Saul in the desire of age. I'm sorry, not the desire of ages. It is in, um. Patriarch, is it Patriarchs and Prophets? I think it is. Okay, Prophets or Kings or Patriarchs and Prophets. I'm not sure which one it's in. It's in the very end, I think, of maybe Patriarchs and Prophets. But anyway, so you're going to put yourself in his shoes. Very early, and I'm going to read this, and it's a bit long, so just pay attention to the details. Very early in his reign, after the assembly at Gilgal, Saul disbanded the army that had at his call arisen to overthrow the Ammonites, reserving only 2,000 men to be stationed under his command, and 1,000 of those to be stationed under Jonathan at his command in Gibeah. Now remember, Saul is fairly new here. This is the first king they've ever had. He has... Very, not, very little to, to rely on. So when you think about him, remember, this is background, what I'm reading here for what's going to happen. Here was a serious error in what he just did. His army was filled with hope and courage, raring to go by the recent victory that they had just had. And he had proceeded at once against, had he proceeded at once against other enemies of Israel, a telling blow with God's power might have been struck for the liberties of his nation. While this was going, their warlike neighbors, the Philistines, were active. After the defeat at Ebenezer, where they had taken the ark and then returned it because it caused him such grief. Do you remember that story? Yeah. They still, these Philistines still retained possession of some of the hill fortresses in the land of Israel. So sprinkled about through the land were these fortresses that they, the Philistines established themselves in, in the very heart of the country. The first blow was struck by Jonathan, the king's son, who attacked and overcame the Philistine garrison at Giva. And the Philistines, exasperated by this defeat, made ready for a speedy attack on Israel. Saul now declared war by sounding of the trumpet throughout the land, calling upon all the Israelite men of war, including the tribes across the Jordan. And that says something if you know their history. He even called them to come and help, to assemble at Gilgal, and the summons was obeyed. The Philistines, on the other hand, had gathered an immense force at Michmash, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand, which is on the seashore of a multitude. When the news of this reached Saul at at his army at Gilgal, people were appalled 
at the thought of the mighty forces they would have to encounter in that battle. Remember, he'd shrunk his army down, sent them all home. The people were not prepared to face the enemy, and many were so afraid and terrified that they dared not come to te- the test of the encounter. Some crossed the Jordan, probably went back home, while others hid themselves in caves and pits amid the rocks that abounded in that region. As the day for battle approached, the number of desertions rapidly increased. Now, desertion is a very serious thing then as it is now. And those who did not withdraw from the ranks were filled with foreboding and terror. That, can you imagine the tension that must have been around at that time? It must have been on screech. And now comes the crux of the situation. When Saul was first anointed king of Israel, he had received from Samuel explicit directions concerning the course to be pursued at this very time, namely, wait. Samuel had said, Thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice of, sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry, wait, till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Day after day, Saul waited, and he made no decided efforts towards encouraging the, the people or inspiring confidence in God to them. Before the time appointed by the prophet had fully expired, Saul became impatient. Er, me. Deadlines. At, he was impatient at the delay and allowed himself to be discouraged uh, again by the trying circumstances that surrounded him. I guess you're the captain of an army and it's dissolving as you watch, evaporating the very minute you're even speaking. He became discouraged, impatient, maybe even panicking feeling that God was not going to come through to bless him and this battle. You can't blame him in that respect. He knew he needed God. He knew what was going to be needed to happen. And his, and his army is just, instead of faithfully seeking to prepare the people for the service that Samuel was coming to perform, he indulged in unbelief. And here's the biggie foreboding, borrowing trouble. Mm, Another big one for me. The work of seeking God by sacrifice was a most solemn and important work. He knew that. That Israel had been operating on that for hundreds of years, even in their comings and goings with God. God required that his people should search their hearts and repent of their sins, that the offering might be made with acceptance before him and that his blessing might attend their efforts to conquer the enemy. But Saul had grown restless, and the people, instead of trusting in God for help, were looking at Saul. They had chosen him. He was their man. They were looking at him to lead and direct. The time for the proving of Saul had come. He was now to either show whether or not he would depend on God or and patiently wait according to God's command, or thus revealing himself one as one whom God, oh, I'm sorry, also that he would reveal that he was somebody who God could trust in trying places as the ruler of his people, or whether he would be vacillating and unworthy of the sacred responsibility that had devolved upon him. What a heavy thing, all based on one thing. Wait. Would the king whom Israel had chosen listen to the ruler of all kings? Would he turn the attention of his faint-hearted soldiers to the one in whom is everlasting strength and deliverance? With growing impatience, he awaited the arrival of Samuel and attributed the confusion and the distress and the desertion of his army to the absence of the prophet. The appointed time came. But the man of God did not immediately appear. You know, our God 
he's amazing. He answers right on time. And like I, I heard, it's never early, unfortunate for us. It's on time. We would like it early and I can have all the details. So I'm prepared when it happens. There's a reason why we don't get that. But Saul's restless, impulsive spirit. Wait, sorry. God's providence had detained Samuel purposefully. But Paul's, re- um, but Saul's restless. Oh, I just switched people there. Did you see that? Not Paul, Saul, different Saul. His impulsive spirit would no longer be restrained. Feeling that something had to be done and now, and he was late to calm the fears of the people, Saul determined to summon an assembly for the religious service and by sacrifice entreat the divine aid himself. I can just see myself in this situation, maybe not a king in a battle, but I can just see justifying my my actions based on what was happening around me. It made total sense to Saul. But part of the problem was that God had directed that only those consecrated to the office should present sacrifices before him. Saul commanded, bring hither a burnt offering. And fully dressed in his armor and his weapons of war, he approached the altar and offered sacrifice before God. And it... <laughs> And it came to pass, just as soon as he had made the end of offering and the burnt offering, behold, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Samuel saw right off that Saul had gone contrary to the express directions that had been given him. The Lord had spoken by his prophet that at this time he would reveal what Israel must do in this crisis, and Saul had not waited. If Saul had fulfilled the conditions upon which divine help was promised, the Lord would have wrought a marvelous deliverance for Israel with the few who were loyal to the king. Like I said earlier, God doesn't, God may, do we feel that he gives promises that have no response, no ending? No, it just says right there. He would have wrought marvelously for them. But Saul was so satisfied with himself and with his work that he went out to the prophet as one who should be commended rather than disapproved. Samuel's countenance was full of anxiety and trouble. What hast thou done? He said. Saul made excuses for his presumptuous act, and he thought they were good excuses. And in a worldly way, they were. His army was was evaporating, and Samuel didn't show up when he said he would. Well, at the very crack of dawn, perhaps. Samuel, I mean, Saul said, I saw that the men were deserting me. And that you did not come within the days appointed? And that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash? Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me in Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, and that did sound good, right? He had all the reasons lined up, but with God, that didn't... That had no water, held no water. Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded you. For now would the Lord have established your kingdom upon Israel forever. We do not know the great, what great interests may be at stake in the proving of God. There is no safety except strict obedience to the word of God. All his promises are made upon condition of faith and obedience. So apparently, promises are made that can lead to nothing if there is what? No faith, no obedience. So there is a part to play. Faith and obedience. Without that and a failure to comply with his command cuts off the fulfillment to us of the rich provisions of scripture. 
We should not follow impulse nor rely on the judgment of men. We should look to the revealed will of God and walk according to his definite commandment, no matter what the circumstances may be that surround us. God will take care of the results. By faithfulness to his word, we may, in time of trial, prove before men and angels that the Lord can trust us in difficult places to carry out his will, honor his name, and bless his people. Waiting on the Lord... Oh, I have to tell you that the last lesson in the in the quarterly this quarter is on waiting. And I stole a quote out of it, so you might hear this again. Waiting on the Lord is not an idle and desperate biding of one's time. Instead, waiting on the Lord is an act full of trust and faith. A trust and faith revealed in action. Ooh, action. Waiting on the Lord transforms our gloomy evenings with the expectancy of the bright morning. It strengthens our hearts with renewed hope and peace. It motivates us to work harder, bringing in the sheaves of plentiful harvest from the Lord's mission fields. Ah, the work is to get out and do the Lord's work. Wow, faith, trust, and do God's work. Waiting on the Lord will never put us to shame, but will be richly rewarded because the Lord is faithful to all his promises. If God says it, it is done. And I might add, it might be done whether you believe or not. Yeah, this, that blows your mind if you think about it long enough. So I found six things about waiting that I think are important, and you probably can add a whole gob more. So just remember... I'll, I'll, if you text them to me or whatever, I can add them in. If I'm going to wait on God, first I've got to trust him until he gives me the directive. Now, that's, again, easy said, especially when you're under a time crunch and or restrictions. When the time is right, he will move. Is there anything too hard for God? No. Can God control every and every circumstance? Yes. If God says, wait, will something slip out from under God's care? (laughs) No. If we stop and think about it, the power of God, the love of God, the wisdom of God, we're not going to miss anything we ought to have by waiting on him. It all boils down to, do I trust him or not to come through? That waiting can be brutal or just as simple as deciding between peas and broccoli for some people. The second thing required is patience. In the 37th Psalm, he says three times, do not fret. Don't allow anxiety fill you when you can ask God about it and leave it with him. If I asked you, do you believe God loves you? You'd say yes, right? What would you include in that definition of love? that God is an advisor to you, he provides for you, he helps you, he strengthens you. You'd say those things, right? If you believe in these, then you can be patient for God to show you the right time to anything and everything. The right time to make a purchase. The right time to go back to school, find a different job. God's timing is always perfect. He has our best interest at heart. And if we believe that, then we're going to be patient and wait. He also knows that he also knows that even during a time crunch or a deadline, it's important to believe and obey and wait. You may say, I don't have time to waste. I've got to make a decision such as that application has to be in this week or I am disqualified. Pavel Goya, I have to tell you, he did a story where he was disqualified because he refused to do something God didn't tell him to. So he refused to to do it, and they disqualified him. Six months later, they came to him and said, it's all yours because you didn't remove your request, and everybody else did. It's yours. It's like he waited in apparent error that God's way was just amazingly answered. So now I've lost my place. I had to tell you that. (laughs) 
So you never waste time waiting on God, never. His timing is right. It's always on time. So it takes trust, patience, and the third thing is courage. Joshua 1 says, be strong and courageous. Mm -hmm. It takes courage to say no to offers of advice from other people. Have you ever thought about that? Many things look really good. Why wouldn't they be from God? But his directive may be totally different to you. And then sometimes we wonder, well, why? Why did you do that? And sometimes we'll never know why. So we have the trust, the patience, the courage, and then we need determination. Why determination? Because there are so many things that others say, think, or try to influence or sway us. They might say, but this is the chance of a lifetime. What are you waiting for? What's wrong with you? Deep down inside you hear, uh, 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 uh. By the way, how do you spell that? You hear the, you hear that. And if you don't obey the heating of the Holy Spirit, guess what? He doesn't get louder and louder and louder in directive, softer. Mm -hmm. So you have to determine to wait on God, regardless of what people are urging you to do. The pressure's on and everyone has an opinion to offer you, but you have to be determined. So if you have trust, patience, courage, determination, then you surely also need strength to not move until God says to. That's like walking in the kitchen and being starving and seeing potato chips on the counter. That need for strength at that moment is way almost overwhelming. And in a situation where you've got to make a decision, the overwhelming urge to just decide and get it done, it's incredible. It takes strength, and he is our source for that. There is no other source to get past that desire to get out from under or to have or to do. So especially when someone is saying, oh, come on, come on, it's going to be okay. No one changes the mind of God by telling you it's going to be okay. Pressure and deadlines require God to strengthen you to wait. You have to be careful, though, because it's awful easy to listen to louder voices than the whisper of the Holy Spirit. So if you have trust, patience, courage, determination, and strength, then the last one is endurance. Mm. Having to listen to people tell you why you should or shouldn't requires endurance. I probably even more so listen to yourself. Tell yourself why you shouldn't or why you should. Having, having to listen to that can wear you down. You have to decide either to listen to others or be obedient to God and wait for him. It's a lesson we learn by experience. And we develop trust and faith in him by doing it. That's why it's so important, that wait thing. Why wake us wait? Why not give me that right now? Give me the answer, whatever it is. Because it develops in us faith and trust. And... That's something like I said earlier, I want to learn it now. I don't want to wait till the end of the world to learn it. I don't even think I can endure it. So there they are, my six. Trust, patience, courage, determination, strength, and endurance. Obey God and leave the consequences and the outcomes to him. I'm willing to hang in there, God, until you show me. I will wait until I know I've heard from you. It's never too late to start listening and waiting on the Lord. Here's another quote from Ellen White. And she says, had Saul been willing to see and confess his error, this bitter experience would have proved a safeguard for the future. He would have learned from it. He would have built trust. He would afterward have avoided the mistakes which called forth divine reproof. But feeling that he was unjustly condemned, he would, of course, be likely again to commit that same sin. The Lord would have his people under all circumstances manifest implicit trust in him. Although we cannot always understand the workings of his providence, we should wait with patience and humility until he sees fit to enlighten us. We should beware of taking upon ourselves responsibilities which God has not authorized us to bear. 
Men frequently have too high an estimate of their own character or their own abilities. They may feel competent to undertake the most important work when God sees that they are not prepared to perform aright the smallest and the humblest duties. Our Lord's commandment to wait on him as it is an impossible one unless his work is done in us through the Holy Spirit. Keep on keeping on. Stay in his presence. No amount of human enthusiasm will ever stand up to the strain that waiting will impose upon our frail selves. Only one thing will bear that strain, and that is abiding in Jesus in a personal relationship with him. Matthew 6, 31, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. And here's what we do while we wait. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. While you wait, seek God and his righteousness. Sing praises, worship him. Like we were talking, change your focus, move it around. You don't have to ask for all of that stuff over and over. He already knows. Start today in the small things, listening, watching. Learn to wait now so that it won't be so hard later. Psalm 57, 7, and this was our opening text. My heart is confident in you, my God. My heart is confident. No wonder I can sing your praises. Let's pray. Lovely Father, Teach us to believe, teach us to trust, to be patient, courageous in you, determined, strong by your power, and have the endurance you give to bring glory to your holy name. Amen. Amen.